Good morning. Good morning to everybody who has gathered with us here in person, to those joining us online. Welcome to Zion Ministries Under the Cross here in Deerfield Beach, Florida. My name is Kurt Schmidt. I serve here as the Cantor Communications and Outreach Specialist here at Zion. I'm joined this morning by Pastor Dave Dangerfield, who is leading us in worship and preaching this morning. Thank you and welcome. Thank you also to Peggy for uh, staffing our greeting table this morning, to Shelley for reading, and for all those who make worship possible in this place. It is the seventh Sunday after Epiphany. We are inching ever closer to the Feast of Transfiguration and to the season of Lent, where we prepare ourselves for the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. And time just keeps marching on. But here we are at the place where, where Jesus and where God promises to be. Together we join in prayer and in song and in thanksgiving for what God has done for us. Uh, for those of you who are here worshiping us, with us in person, everything you need will be on the screens. For those worshiping with us online, whether uh, live in real time or later on in the week, uh, there is a bulletin available on our website which is zion-lutheran.org. On our homepage there, you'll see welcome new friends, and then also a link to our giving page, and uh, both today's bulletin and today's sermon notes that Pastor Dave has provided for us. You may notice that there are a few elements missing from this morning's service, some of the non-essentials, which, which will allow some of us, uh, as soon as church is over, to make our way back over to Deerfield Beach, right on the beach, where this weekend the city is hosting Pioneer Days, which is a celebration of uh, Deerfield Beach and all that is good there. You'll hear me mention more about that in our announcements. Uh, but here we are again, where God promises to be. Let us hold this time sacred and holy. Let us prepare our hearts for worship by standing as we're able for the thanksgiving for baptism. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, the God, the one God, the fountain of living water, the rock who gave us birth, our light and our salvation. Amen. Join in Christ in the waters of baptism. We are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for the beginning of your spirit moved over the waters. And by your word, you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood, you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea, you led your people, Israel, from slavery to freedom. From the river, your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water, your word, you proclaim us as daughters and sons, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life, and above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, make us instruments of your peace, that where there is hatred, we may sow love, where there is injury, pardon, where there is despair, hope. Grant, O Divine Master, we may seek to console to understand, to love in your name. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 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 Please be seated. Hello again. Special welcome to those who may be visiting with us this morning. I see some faces that are new to me, and uh, maybe so also online. 
Uh, if you would be so kind as to take the Connect card that is in front of you in the pew, uh, and let us know that you were here by sharing your name, your phone number, your email, any or all of that, uh, any prayer requests that you might have or uh, questions for us. The same information can be filled out online on our homepage there where it says Welcome New Friends. There's a link to a page where, again, your name, your email, your phone number, and it just gives us a chance to follow up with you. Uh, but we appreciate those who visit with us. We appreciate even more those who visit and return again. So uh, if that is the case, uh, everybody is welcome here. Um, that is uh, something you'll hear again and again, not only today, but it's uh, a part of our culture here at Zion, that all are welcome. God's doors are open to all. A few words about where we are going after church this morning, uh, and that is to Pioneer Days. You heard me mention that. This weekend in Deerfield Beach is not only the Festival of the Arts, um, which was supposed to be held in January, but was postponed due to uh, COVID concerns, uh, but it is Pioneer Days, which is a celebration of uh, all that is great about the city of Deerfield Beach. Um, you should know that other than the city organizations that were there, there were only four civic organizations present. Uh, the Women's Club, Kiwanis, uh, Deerfield Beach Community Cares, and Zion Lutheran Church. So we were the only church represented there. We'll be the only church there again today. Uh, and by our estimates yesterday, uh, we uh, saw approximately probably 10,000 people. So 10,000 people saw that Zion was there. 10,000 people walked past our tent. Uh, some even stopped to share prayer requests with us, and you'll see those next week. Uh, some uh, asked questions about uh, what it is that we do and who we are, and we were able to share information with them and, uh, and encourage them to join us for services. Uh, but as we know, <coughs> The commission that Jesus gives us is to go and make disciples. So we will be doing that as soon as worship is over this morning. Uh, our, our apologies to you all. Please fellowship out in the portico, uh, but we will be making our way to the beach as quickly as possible. So I hold in my hand the sign-up sheet, uh, which is a little bit empty this afternoon. And it was out on the table and I said to Peggy, I'm going to bring it in. And I'm going to simply hold it up and say, there are some spots here. And I know that God is going to work it out, that if you're watching online and saying, you know, I really wanted to come to Pioneer Days, that you might spend a little time sitting at Zion's tent and, uh, and showing the good news of Jesus in Deerfield Beach. Or if you're here this morning and you're able to come by for a little bit, we would really appreciate it. Uh, it's a wonderful event. We had a lot of fun yesterday. Stands to be the same today with even better weather. As always, our AA groups continue to meet. Uh, the women's group meets on Monday at 7, Old Timers Saturday at 7, both at Arcadia Luther Chapel. If you know somebody that is in need of a recovery meeting, you can direct them to either one of those or to the Broward County Intergroup website where all of the meetings across Broward County are listed. There are materials available in our narthex, which is our gathering space, uh, surrounding the 40 days of giving which is a campaign by ELCA World Hunger. Um, there's a calendar that you can hang up in your home that uh, includes Bible references and uh, suggestions, songs, hymns uh, for the 40 days of Lent. And there's also a devotional and a, a weekly study guide. Those are available They're at no cost. Uh, if you'd like it, take it. Um, if you'd like it mailed to you, I know we have some members who are homebound You'll be receiving those in the mail, um, but if you want to make double sure that you'll be receiving it, please call me or text me or email me and let me know. We'll be glad to get them in the mail to you uh, so that you have them in time for the season of Lent, which is literally just around the corner. Which gives me good reason to talk to you for a minute about our upcoming Wednesday night Bible study and potluck. Uh, we will be looking at a study by Rick Warren based on the movie The Son of God, uh, and it makes comparisons between Jesus' life and ministry and our life and ministry. So whether it's your first Bible study or your hundredth Bible study, there's always something new to learn. There's always new truth uh, to, to grasp, new depth uh, to reach. And so we encourage that you join us 
for all five Wednesdays, or all five Wednesdays in March, plus April 6th. So the schedule is a little bit different. We will meet on Ash Wednesday, which is the first Wednesday in March, March 2nd. We'll meet only for Bible study here in the church, and then for worship at seven o'clock on Ash Wednesday. The following weeks, we'll meet in Katie Luther Chapel, and we'll begin at 5.30 with a potluck. Bring what you can if you can, and uh, continue with Bible study at six, and prayer at the end of the day at seven. So uh, we hope that you'll consider making an evening out of being together with us. Uh, if you are unable to do that because of your work uh, or for other reasons, you can join us on Zoom for the Bible study and Facebook Live for prayer at the end of the day. Giving statements are available if you step out into our gathering space on the table uh, closest to the fire alarm. They're there in an accordion file listed alphabetically by last name if you have not yet received your giving statement for the year 2021 and you need it for your taxes, uh, it is there available for you. If you notice any discrepancies, uh, feel free to see either Gail Schmidt or Robin Larson and uh, they will help you to resolve those. Uh, we hope that you are connected in as many ways as possible uh, by receiving our weekly email newsletter, by following us on social media, uh, by regularly visiting our website to try and keep everything as up to date as possible and so that you are informed plugged in and so you, that you can be present uh, for the ministries and the mission of this congregation. Those are our announcements this morning. We continue with the reading of scripture. First reading is from Genesis chapter 45, verses 3 to 11 and 15. Joseph said to his fathers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold in Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me because before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there were five more years in which there will be neither plowing their harvest. God sent me before you to preserve you a remnant of good and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it will not it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and like Lord of all his house and ruler over the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children, and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. Word of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, God. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 35 through 38, and 42 to 50. But someone will ask, How are the dead raised? With what kind of body do you come? Food. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And as for what you sow, you do not sow the body that is to be you, but a bare seed, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind a seed of its own body. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, and what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown in physical body, it is raised in spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. So, thus it is written, the first Adam became a being, a living being. The last Adam became a living, living spirit. But it's not the spirit that is first, but the physical, and then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As 
was the man of dust, so are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we will also bear the image of the man of heaven. What I am saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the imperishable, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you, and if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you. What credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to, re to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give, you will be uh, will be the measure you get back. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. Grace, peace, and joy be unto you from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Today we're going to look at this text from Luke's Gospel. So I, I invite you to hold on to this, but also I want to uh, let you know that there is an outline for today, so you can follow along, and as I uh, oftentimes say, uh, you'll know when I'm getting toward the end as well, too, okay? So uh, hang in there with me, alrighty? But uh, today I want to talk about a love that sets us apart. A love that sets us apart. But before we get into that, I'd like for us to pray together. Would you pray with me the prayer that's up on the screens? Come Holy Spirit. Fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. Amen. Last week, the gospel lesson was from the earlier portion of Luke's gospel, the sixth chapter, which is often called the Sermon on the Plain, which is Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount, okay, which is found in Matthew's gospel. And, uh, but today, as I read those words and as I looked at them earlier in the week, I said, wow, who can do that, huh? Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you and so forth and so on. And I thought, wow, whoever can do that does have a love that sets them apart, doesn't it, huh? Absolutely. And we 
live in such divisive times right now, don't we? I think it's the most divisive time that I've ever lived in, and, and I've been alive a long time. And, and with everything from politics to public health challenges, people with different opinions, oftentimes demonize those who have different opinions, don't they, huh? Don't we, oftentimes? Where people are in positions of leadership, they often uh, dismiss others and, and that kind of thing. It's a difficult time to live out these words of Jesus. It almost seems impossible, doesn't it, huh? It seems impossible. And yet, Jesus says in Matthew uh, chapter 19, verse 2, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Jesus is not expecting you or me to live out these words all on our own, by our own willpower. Anybody tried that? Amen, huh? Yeah, all of us have tried that at times, haven't we, huh? It's not possible. It's not possible. But with God, it is possible. Jesus says to love our enemies, to do good, to uh, uh, not to hate, to bless those who curse us, to strike, not, not to strike those who strike us. Well, it's interesting because what that boils down to is love, isn't it? Huh? Love. And the Greeks had four words for love. And, and you see those up on, the, up on the screen. They had four different words for love, noting different aspects. How many of you have heard about that before, huh? I'm sure many of you have. Okay? So, one of the loves is friendship. We get the word Philadelphia from that word, Philadelphia. Okay? Philadelphia. And it means friendship. Philadelphia means city of brotherly love, right? Okay, so that's where that comes from. A second word for love that the Greeks had was the word eros. That's what romantic love. That's what many of us celebrated this past Monday with Valentine's Day, huh? And uh, 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 we get the word erotic from that word, okay? The third kind of love is the word storge. That's family love. Now, think about it for a moment. Our family love is different than any other love, isn't it, huh? What we have love for our parents, for our siblings, for our children, is different than any of the others. So that's why they have that word, storge. And, but all three of those, phileo, eros, and storge, there's a certain amount of self-interest in it, isn't there, huh? Maybe I want to have friendship with somebody because they're powerful or popular or that, something like that, huh? Or perhaps uh, uh, in romance, you want to have it because you want to have romance in your life, right? And family love, yes, there's something of self-interest even in our family love, okay? But the fourth word that the Greeks had for love, which didn't come about until the Christian era, 2,000 years ago, is the word agape or agape. Okay? It means the self-giving love. It's, it's used in John 3.16, for God so loved the world. That's the word that's used there. It's not phileo, it's not eros, it's not sorge, it's agape. It's the word that's used in 1 Corinthians 13 which is often sometimes referred to as the love chapter. So, the question for me and for you is how do we define love? Because Jesus is talking in this gospel lesson about loving your enemies, doing good to others, and so forth and so on. Well, there was a book written probably now 30 years ago or so by M. Scott Peck. Any of you read that or familiar with that book? It's a, it's, a, it's a great book. It is a wonderful book. I just want to share with you. M. Scott Peck was a psychiatrist that uh, 
ended up growing and into becoming a Christian. And I think he ended up actually becoming a Quaker. But, but he explores what love is all about. And he writes a definition, which I think is really a very good definition. I put it up on the screens for you. He defines love as the will to extend oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's own or another's spiritual growth. The will to extend oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's own or another's spiritual growth. Let's look at that definition just very briefly here. Number one, it's the will. Oftentimes we think of, of love being something emotional, don't we, huh? We, we put it in, in terms of emotion. But real love is a matter of the will. In other words, it starts with the decision, doesn't it, huh? It starts with our brain, with us saying, hey, this is really important, and I'm going to make it important in my life. Okay? That it's the will, and it's that love is more than just a feeling. It's more than a sentiment, okay? And, and we need to understand that, that love is a decision. Love is something that's willful. Secondly, it's about extending oneself, okay? Extending. Uh, Gail, will you go back one slide on that? Just keep on that for a few minutes here. But it, it means extending oneself. It, love is more than a feeling or a sentiment, as I just said. Because sentiments come and go, don't they? Huh? Feelings come and go. And we can, we can uh, say, hey, you know what, maybe I feel like loving my wife today. Or maybe I don't feel like loving my wife today. Huh? But I, I want to love my wife because I made a decision almost 13 years ago to love my wife. And, and that's key to, and you see, uh, extending ourselves means that I need to move in some kind of way, doesn't it, huh? It means I, I need to have an action of some kind. Extending myself is more than just thinking about it. It requires action, and that's important. It's also the purpose of nurturing, nurturing. If we're nurturing someone, let's say our child, that means we make sure they see the doctor, huh? It means they get what they need to eat. It means that they go to bed on time. It means they need to go to school. And those kinds of things, all these kinds of things. Nurturing means we want to see someone else grow. Grow. Scott Peck uh, talks about this in his book. He says, you know, there, there was a, uh, a person who came to him as a patient and said, oh, my, my mom really loved me. She loved me so much that every day she wouldn't let me take the bus to school. She drove me to school. And Scott Peck asked the patient, do you think that was really loving and nurturing? Some of it was, but at a certain point, before you became a senior in high school, your mom needed to let you ride the bus one day to school. Why? Because that's nurturing someone, isn't it, huh? To get out there and to be exploring the social world and so forth. You see, love is about nurturing either ourselves, which means that I'm growing. I nurture myself when I read more. I nurture myself when I exercise more. I nurture myself when I extend myself for somebody else. I serve somebody else. And you do the same thing. Those are all nurturing actions, you see. My good friend, Ron Dingle, Pastor Ron Dingle, one of the sayings he's known for is if you aren't growing, you're dying. Think about that. If you aren't growing, you're dying. Because you're not nurturing yourself or anybody else for that matter. That's critical. Uh, 
All right? That's critical. And so it's also love, then, as I put on the outline, is interested in self and in others, okay? And it, it says in the definition, our own or another's spiritual growth. Spiritual growth. Our spirit is the deepest part of who I am, and it's the deepest part of who you are, and of every other human being that's out in the world. All of us have a spiritual side, don't we, huh? And when we're helping somebody to grow spiritually, then they're becoming familiar with themselves and with their creator, with God, with Jesus, and with the Holy Spirit. And being loving is a process. It's not a, oh, all of a sudden I'm there. It's a lifelong process. It's a lifelong pro process. It takes, honestly, repentance. A change of mind. That, in other words, love is not all about me. Love is not all about me. And that love is an act. It's not a sentiment. It's a sacrifice. And, and M. Scott Peck calls us to that. So, here Jesus is calling us to love our enemies, do good to those who persecute us, and so forth and so on. How do we do that? How do we do that? Well, particularly if we're not used to doing but you know what? What is true of all of us? Each one of us can change in some way, can't we, huh? And I, I say on the slide that I was so glad to see the, uh, the reading that Shelley read a few moments ago, the first one, from uh, the book of Genesis. Who was that all about? Who was that about? Who was speaking there? Joseph was, okay? Joseph in the Old Testament. Now, do you know the story of Joseph? I've listed on your outline the chapters you can look at for Joseph's uh, story. I'm not going to uh, read all that by any means. But I, let me just give you the short version of Joseph's life. Joseph is born into a family. He's one of the youngest sons, one of the younger sons. And honestly, what was the truth was that Joseph's mom, because his father had several uh, wives, okay? His mom, Joseph, was, was the favorite wife of his dad. And Joseph, being her firstborn son, was his father's favorite. And so Joseph grows up into this family. There's 12 brothers, okay? The other 11, or at least 10 out of the 11, got tired of hearing that he was the favorite. Okay? There was some jealousy going on among the brothers. So what happens? One day they decide he's out in the wilderness watching the sheep and so forth. They decide they're going to beat him up, throw him in a pit, and as their caravan is going by, they sell him to the caravan going to Egypt. Okay? Any of you ever seen the, the movie or the, uh, uh, Joseph and the, the Technicolor Dreamcoat? That's the story that it's all about, okay? All right. So anyway, so he's sold into Egypt. He, he ends up in Egypt. He ends up being a guy in charge of a fellow by the name of Potiphar's house. And Potiphar is a prominent official and so forth. And, and Potiphar, Potiphar's wife uh, gets to know Joseph some, and she makes a play for him. But Potiphar is awake. And so what happens is that uh, Joseph says, hey, this is not why I'm here, okay? And so he flees, but he leaves his coat. And, and Potiphar uh, realizes when he gets home that, hey, Joseph left his coat here. Why did he leave? His, his Potiphar's wife says, well, he tried to seduce me. And it's exactly the opposite. And so Joseph gets thrown in jail. When he's in jail, he encounters some people who used to work for the Pharaoh and so forth, and he deciphers some dreams for them, okay? And, and anyway, uh, 
uh, he gets to be known by the uh, by the uh, Pharaoh. And the Pharaoh has had some dreams. He can't understand. So he calls for Joseph, calls him out of prison, and come and decipher these, these dreams for him. He does. He tells him that there's going to be this famine coming up, and you need to prepare for seven years. It's because you're going to have seven years of want. In other words, you're not going to have any growth. And so Joseph ends up in the government ruling over this whole famine, how we help people and so forth. Well, lo and behold, what happens? People all around that region hear that, that the Pharaoh has got plenty of food because Joseph told him to do that. And so who comes before him one day but his brothers? Now, they thought that Joseph was probably dead by now. He recognizes them, but he doesn't say anything to them. Then he asks them, hey, do you have another brother? Because the youngest one, Benjamin, is still at home. Yes, we'll go get him and bring him back. And so then he reveals himself. And those are the words that are from the gospel lesson for today. Look at those words again in that first lesson. He says, I am Joseph, is my father still alive? But his brothers couldn't answer him. So dismayed were they at his presence. Why are they dismayed at his presence? Because they figure he's going to take vengeance out on them now, right? That's why. And so what happens is he's reunited with them. He's reunited with them. And on your, on your outline for today, look at the words from uh, chapter 45, verses 5 to verse 8. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here for God sent me before you to preserve life. And then in verse 8, so it was not you who sent me here, he says to them, but God who has made me a father to Pharaoh and a lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. If anybody had reason to take out vengeance, it was Joseph, wasn't it, huh? And yet, he loves those who persecuted him, sold him into slavery. You see, that's what God is calling for you and me to do. And how does that happen? How does that happen? That only happens through the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at what Paul in the New Testament writes. It's up on the screens. From Galatians 5, verse 14. Only with the help of the Holy Spirit. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then he writes a few verses later. For if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. You see, the Jews were always looking at the law. And Paul had done that himself because he was a, a Jew, he was a Pharisee. And the law always makes us look back, makes us look back. Oh, I can't do this, I can't do that, right? You should not kill, you should not commit adultery, you should not do this and that, and so forth and so on. The Spirit always helps us to look forward. What can I do in my life? What can I do in my life? And, and I'm sorry, but I didn't print out on either the outline or up on these screens the, the, the fruits of the Spirit. Listen to these fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience. Anybody here need a little dose of patience in their life? Huh? I'm glad to see my wife raise her hand, too. Yep. And, and yeah, that we need all those kinds of kindness, goodness, Fruitfulness, gentleness, self-control, we all need those things. And the Holy Spirit can give us that. That's why we say, only with the help of the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus doesn't expect us to be able to do it on our own. We need his help and encouragement. And Jesus brings that through the Spirit in the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.
before we pray, I'd like to share something with you all. As Kurt mentioned, we've been out this weekend at the Pioneer Days Festival. And what we've done when we've gone out to the community over the last few years is we've asked people, who can we pray for? Now, in years past, we gave them strips of cloth and said, write somebody's name down. Last year at the Fall Festival, we asked them to write names on leaves and pin them on a tree. Well, this year, we're asking them to write names on a board. And so I'm going to share two experiences yesterday, and maybe that'll inspire us to go out there and ask people, who can we pray for? So people are going to a festival. It's a street festival. They're looking for fun, have a good time. It's beautiful. It's the beach. One lady yesterday coming by with her adult beverage in her hand, and I stopped and said, hey, who can we pray for? And she stopped, and her eyes filled with tears, and she said, my identical twin sister is battling stage four colon cancer. And I said, well, then let's put her name up here on the board. Another lady marching by, and I interrupted her pace, and I said, who can we pray for? And she stormed over to the table, took the marker, and she scribbled something on the board. And as she walked away, she gave me a thumbs up and said, thank you. And I was a little surprised. I went to look to see whose name, and she had simply written the word sanity. And I thought, touche, yes, we can all pray for sanity in this crazy world. A father, the two boys, Scott. And we were handing the boys slack bracelets and frisbees. And just out of curiosity, I said, is there anybody we can pray for? And the older one, about 11, looked up at his dad. And his dad nodded and said, yeah. And so the little boy took a marker, and he looked back at his dad, and his dad said, Jessica, J-E-S. And the little boy started to write it. And as he was doing that, his dad was spelling it for him. The dad looked at me and he said, they lost their mom last year. Mm. Our prayers matter to our community and to the world. So join with me now as we pray. Dear God, thank you for the opportunity to go out into the world and share the news about you, what you've done for us, and what we can do for one another. Lord, in your mercy. For Jessica and all of the people in our hearts. Ken, Janet, Jeannie, Margaret, Jane, Jaden, Buddy, Betty, Chuck. Joanna, Jean, Chris, Amanda, Marlene, Brian, Linda, the Clagus family, Uncle Charlie, Pat, David, Bethann, Bill, Chrissy, Lorraine, Seve, Jackie, Joe, Debbie, Todd, Katie, Pat, Pete, Carol, Billy, Adriana, Beth, Lisa, Chris, Jennifer, Alyssa, Laura, Danny, Allie, Grant, Brent, Doris, Andy, Lahana, Kevin, Mary Lou, and those that we name aloud or in the silence of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we ask you to bring peace to this world, to the people facing threats and danger in Ukraine. Please let love and peace reign there and throughout our world. Lord, in your mercy. We praise you for all the saints who have inherited the fullness of your kingdom as you have raised them to eternal life. Sustain us in faith by the promise of resurrection in your mercy. Thank you for all that you've given us, O oh God. We lift these and all of our prayers to you through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen.
Peace the Lord be with you always. Let us share the peace. receive first the bread and then the wine. Once those on the south side of communion, those in the center and the north section, north side are welcome. Come, for all is now ready. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Welcome to the Lord's table.
Thank you. 